Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to speak about uh, uveal melanoma today. These are my uh, disclosures. So, uh, you know, melanoma is a disease that starts in the pigment cells of the skin. These are the cells that give the skin its tan or, or, or dark color. It mostly starts on the sun exposed parts of the skin, but can also start on the sun shielded parts of the skin, such as on the soles or palms or under the fingernails, so-called acral lentiginous melanoma. It can start on the mucosal membranes, it can also start in the eye, where it may start in the conjunctiva, which is the uh, mucous membrane that covers the outer part of the eye and the inside of the eyelids, or in the uveal tract or so-called uveal melanoma, which is the subject of our discussion uh, today. So uveal melanoma, it constitutes uh, about 95% of ocular melanomas, uh, and it may arise in the so-called choroid, as shown here, which is a vascular membrane that contains connective tissue and lies between the retina and the outer part of the eye, so-called sclera. Or it can start in the ciliary body, uh, which is part of the middle layer of the wall of the eye and lies uh, behind the iris, the, which is the colored part of the eye where uveal melanoma can also arise. The remainder of these ocular melanomas can be, as I said, in the conjunctiva or rarely in the orbit. The incidence of uveal melanoma in the US is upward of 3,000 new cases each year. There is about 50% risk of developing metastases uh, within 15 years. And if that develops, the liver is the predominant site of metastases. Mortality because of metastases has been estimated at about 20 to 30% of patients within five years and about 45% of patients within uh, 15 years. So what happens when uh, uveal melanoma is diagnosed and is localized to the eye? There are two primary options for managing localized uh, melanoma, uveal melanoma, either surgery, and this is kind of the extreme option these days when it is generally uh, advanced to a point that radiation is not effective because radiation is so-called eye sparing treatment. So the eye can, you know, stays without, without having to remove the eye. Patients would undergo a form of radiation therapy, including so-called plaque brachytherapy, charged particle radiation, and uh, proton, uh, excuse me, photon stereotactic uh, radiation. And there is only about 5% risk of local recurrence following this form of eye sparing radiation therapy. An example on the right here is the plaque brachytherapy, uh, where a radioactive plaque is actually sutures to the, sutured to the globe of the eye behind the location of the uveal melanoma, and left there for about three to seven days uh, to essentially uh, you know, treat uh, the, uh, the melanoma locally. So after this is done, after we treat the uh, localized uveal melanoma, what is the prognosis? What is the likelihood of this coming back in the future? And what helps us determine this prognosis? So as I said, local treatment is effective in preventing local recurrence in more than 95% of cases, and approximately 50% eventually develop metastatic disease. There are certain features, you know, clinical, histopathologic, and molecular features that can guide us in determining the prognosis. Examples of clinical features are the age of the patient, the basal diameter, how wide, how, how you know, the size of this melanoma, ciliary body involvement, extra scleral tumor extension, and these are accounted for, uh, among other features as well, within the uh, so-called TNM staging system. And the molecular features include chromosomal markers like monosomy 3, uh, gene expression profiling, and measuring circulating tumor cells and circulating tumor uh, DNA. What has been shown to be best in terms of prognosis is so-called gene expression profiling. The most commonly used test is a test called DecisionDX, uh, which looks at about 15 genes 
and, and looks at their levels of expression. So we take a biopsy from the original uh, melanoma and a test that looks at the expression of those genes. Expression meaning, are these genes turned on or off? If they're turned on, these lead to uh, subsequent steps and, and an ultimate function or, or, or functional consequences that happen. If they're off, the same thing happens. Certain functions do not, do not occur. So based on the expression levels of those 15 genes, patients are classified into class 1A uh, that are estimated to have a low risk of metastases within five years, class 1B, intermediate risk of metastases within five years, and class 2, high risk of metastases within five years. More recently, a gene or tumor or cancer-associated gene called frame has also been shown to be prognostic in uveal melanoma, and whether this is expressed or not may affect the prognosis. If it's negative, not expressed, does not alter the prognosis. If it's positive, it seems to confer a worse uh, prognosis in these patients. So giving more information about this, the plots on the left looks uh, basically define the uh, percent metastases free. So what's the proportion of patients who are free of metastases uh, over time? So class one would be low risk. And as you can see, class two would have a higher risk of, of metastases and class one B uh, run somewhere in the middle. The table here shows the actual numbers. So the percent metastases free at three years percent metastases free at five years. So for class 1A, this is estimated about 98%, class 1B, 79%, and class 2, about 28%. So coming to PRAME, the, uh, the other uh, gene, uh, it, it seems to affect the prognosis within each class. So if we take patients with a class 1 and they're PRAME positive and look at the proportion of patients who are uh, metastasis free over time, these patients tend to do worse than patients who are prime negative, those who are not expressing this uh, gene. Same applies for class two. Look, the, the plot on the left here, again, the percent metastasis free, uh, uh, metastasis free, uh, prime negative compared to prime positive. And this is here the mortality because of melanoma between patients who are class two and also prime negative compared to prime positive. So in other words, if the patients are prime negative, the class risk is not altered. If it's prime positive, the class risk appears to be elevated. Moving next to the management of metastatic uh, uveal melanoma. Many agents and, and a large number of studies have been tested in, in uh, uveal melanoma. And we got together as an international group of investigators and put together what we call a meta-analysis that combined data from 29 studies, almost 1,000 patients that were treated with different forms of immunotherapy, targeted therapy, anti-angiogenic therapy, chemotherapy, and liver-directed therapy, almost 1,000 patients. What we learned from this meta-analysis, this large combination of studies, is that the likelihood of response with all these different uh, agents that had limited activity uh, is about 10% between complete responses and partial responses. Looking at other measures of efficacy, first progression-free survival, so the likelihood of, of being surviving without uh, melanoma progression and taking the median numbers of some patients had, let's say, uh, two months, others had you know, the two years. So what's the number in the middle? The, month, the median progress-free survival was 3.3 months. In terms of overall survival, how long patients survive, the median number was about uh, 10 months. So these help to be as benchmarks as we develop new treatments and you know, planning to beat and, and improve uh, over these. So one of the forms of treatment has been shown to be very effective in treating uh, skin melanoma or, or has made a major difference there is immunotherapy with so-called CTLA-4 and PD-1 checkpoint uh, blockade. So how does this work? And, and do these have activity in uveal melanoma? Essentially, what we need to do is activate certain cells called T cells in, in brown here, and these act like the soldiers that you know fight the cancer. So the cancer cell is the 
that black circle here, the T cell is the soldier, and we have the dendritic cell, which acts like the programmer that programs the T cell to recognize the cancer cell, and then the T cell will go and, and try to fight the, the cancer cell. This happens through, you know, two main, uh, let's say, steps that we can, you know, simplify things here. First, we have the engagement between the programmer or the dendritic cell and the soldier, the T cell. When this engagement happens, we have activation of the T cell. But physiologically, we have checkpoints in our body to prevent overactivation of the T cells that to avoid autoimmune diseases and, and problems with the immune system. One of them is this receptor called CTLA4 that now gets expressed on top of the T cell and inhibits the activity of the T cell. But because of this T cell being the soldier to, that fights the cancer, this is a problem. And that's why this gave the rationale to develop medications that block this CTLA4, allowing the T cell to do its job. Similarly, when the T cell makes it to the location of the tumor, we have engagement between the T cell and the cancer cell, allowing to fight it, uh, but also has another negative regulator on its surface called PD1, which the cancer cell takes advantage of and engages it with another protein called PDL1 to inhibit. And this gave the rationale to have medications that block this interaction, again, allowing the T cell to do its job. And this, you know, has led to these medications that we use in the clinic, epilimumab, anti-CDLA4, nivolumab, pembrolizumab, anti-PD1, that have been shown in combination and separately to be relatively very effective in treating skin melanoma. When these were tested in uveal melanoma, the combination of ipilimumab and nivolumab, they were tested in so-called observational and small phase two studies. When we put the data together, we see that these are, they have activity in uveal melanoma. It's something that we can try in treating uveal melanoma and the expected response rate is up to about 18%. Up to about 18% of patients are expected to have significant or you know, meaningful responses. The median progression-free survival up to six months, the median overall survival up to 19 months. What recently has been tested in the clinic and reported to be positive is a new molecule called tabentafosp. It has a you know, kind of difficult name to you know, pronounce, but basically it's a, a, a bispecific fusion protein that on one end can recognize the cancer cell, on the other end can recognize the T cell. It's shown in red here. Basically what it does is it engages the, the soldier, the immune system T cell uh, to the cancer cell on the, on the other end. And what it recognizes is a protein called GP100 expressed on top of the melanoma cell with the help of another molecule called HLAA2. But this HLAA2 is not found in every patient. It's found in about 45% uh, of patients in the US to, to whom this may be applicable. Essentially, it engages the, the T cell to the cancer cell, allowing the T cell to uh, you know, fight and destroy the cancer cell. So this was tested in a major study, so-called phase three study, that randomized patients to receive the Ventafos or investigator choice of medications called pembrolizumab, epilimumab, or chemotherapy, the carbazine, all have limited activity, and most patients received pembrolizumab. The one year overall survival rate was 73.2% on the experimental arm, the drug called Tabentafosp, and 58.5% in the control arm. The likelihood of having an objective response shrinkage of the tumor was about 9% with Tabentafosp, 5% in the control arm. The plot here on the right upper right here shows the overall survival. There's a you know, clear difference between the Tabentafast group and the control group in this study. And the hazard ratio was 0.51, meaning it reduces the risk of, of death, the hazard of death by about 49% by the time this data was analyzed. A, an important form of treatment also for patients with uh, melanoma that is localized to the liver, the so-called liver-directed therapy by a treatment called percutaneous hepatic perfusion. And this was tested in a major study led by our colleague here at Moffitt, Dr. John Zager. This therapy isolates the liver circulation and delivers a high concentration of chemotherapy, a drug called melphalan that is eventually filtered uh, out of the body uh, prior to uh, returning the blood to the patient. 
So this phase three study, eligible patients had liver dominant ocular melanoma, were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to receive this PHP treatment or investigator choice of so-called chemoembolization or immunotherapy with pembrolizumab or ipilimumab or chemotherapy with decarbazine. This, this study was also positive as presented by Dr. Zager uh, in June at the uh, ASCO uh, annual meeting. And uh, it showed that there is significant difference in the response rates between the PHP group and the control groups, almost 33% compared to, compared to 14%. And when looking at the progression-free survival, the median was about nine months compared to about uh, three months. Again, suggesting that this or, or, or reporting that this is an important option to treat these patients. Now, important to say that this is not approved by the FDA yet, but it's under review by the FDA. Similar, the same thing applies to the tabentafast drug that's currently under review uh, by the FDA. So in conclusion, uveal melanoma has a unique biology that requires therapeutic considerations distinct from those for cutaneous melanoma. Uh, genetic tests may help with the prognosis of localized disease. Uh, percutaneous hepatic perfusion PHB showed Im uh, improved response rates and progression-free survival. The combination of ipilimumab and nivolumab has been shown to be effective in observational and early phase trials and is an option for our patients in the clinic. The bentafas resulted in longer overall survival than control therapy. And as I said, it's currently under review by the FDA. And emerging insights into the biology of uveal melanoma have led to the development of a series of novel uh, clinical trials. And uh, we are working hard on a number of studies here. We have a, um, a number of studies that are opening up uh, in the next uh, weeks and months as well uh, uh, to, to address our patients' need. And it's important to note that patient participation clinical trials remains a critical part of the standard of care of uveal melanoma patients. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmad, for all of that. I think we are on the verge of making some big progress in uh, melanomas of the eye and other non-melanoma, non-rather cutaneous melanomas, but uh, we still have some work to do and clinical trials are gonna be critically important. 